Hi guys and welcome back for part four of four of the mucus series. That was harder to say than it should have been. Today we're going to be talking about the microbes that live in and around your intestinal mucus layer. And if you're sitting there wondering, lady, why should I care about my intestinal mucus? Well, you must be new to this channel because it, like I said, this is part four of four. If you are curious why we're talking about this, then I would refer you back to videos one through three. And the gist of it is that the mucus layer in your intestines, specifically your colon, is going to be one of the first lines of defense between you, the cells of your colon, the cells of your immune system, and ultimately your bloodstream and therefore the rest of your body and the microbes in your gut. So as you ingest food all day, every day, and as you have interactions with your microbes, one of the lines of defense that you have is this mucus lining that sticks to the cells of your colon and the rest of your digestive tract, like your esophagus, stomach, and small bowel. So this mucus is really, really important for maintaining the health of your gut. And if you don't want to have a leaky gut or an inflamed gut, then the mucus becomes very important. But we can't have a conversation about the mucus without including the little critters that like to live in it. So let's get right into it and I'll teach you a little bit about the microbiota of the mucus itself. First, let's start with a little bit of a structure slash like anatomy of the mucus lesson for a refresher. So remember that the mucus is separating you, the cells of your intestines, the cells of your immune system, and ultimately the gateway to your bloodstream from the microbes that live in your gut. So you can imagine that up here, like even past the whiteboard, would be where all of your food is and all of the microbiome or the majority of your microbiome. And then in this mucus layer, this is where we're talking about. These are the guys that live in the mucus itself and promote its health. So let's talk about some of the most famous bacteria first. And I will say that the current thought process as of 2021, when I'm filming this, is that the dense mucus that is right up against the colon cells, that is really thick, tightly adhered, and relatively impenetrable to microbes. That's really important because you don't want a lot of microbes getting too up close and personal with the cells of the gut lining. So right now, as of recording this, we think that this is relatively impenetrable to microbes. And when we're talking about microbes that live in the mucus, we're really talking about critters that live in this loose mucus. So that's something to know right off the get-go. Now, the first one that is probably the most famous and most consistently documented is a bacteria called Acromancia. And I'm just gonna abbreviate abbreviate it AKK. It's Acromancia mucinophilia. And this is a microbe that degrades the mucus lining, which sounds like a bad thing, but ultimately that helps promote the restoration of the mucus layer. So it's like, yes, it's munching away some of this mucus, but then the loss of that mucus or the signals directly from the microbe are gonna stimulate those goblet cells and the release of more mucus. Now, you might be asking the question, well, cool, can I take a probiotic for that? And this is hot off the press. Yes, you can. Um, I forget the name of it now. It's brand new to the US market. The Acromancia mucinophilia probiotic just came out maybe October 2020, somewhere in that range. So it's very new, but it's very expensive. I haven't used it clinically yet because I would rather try to feed the little guy rather than try to take a probiotic that's 150 bucks a bottle. So as of yet, I don't have experience prescribing this probiotic. If you have experience with it, I'd be deeply curious to hear your thoughts. Like I said, I think it's like 150 or maybe 100 bucks a bottle. So it's a little cost prohibitive, but we do know things that can feed the little stinker. So let's start with that. So first of all, Acrobancia is said to really like red things, not red Skittles, but red polyphenols in food, such as those found in pomegranates, uh, berries, like cherries, cranberries, maybe beets, not sure, but I think so. It seems like all of these red polyphenol foods are going to feed acrobancia to some extent. Even rhubarb, of all the things in the world, rhubarb and the red polyphenols in rhubarb seem to promote the growth of acrobancia. So pretty stinking cool. Another thing that I've observed is that acrobancia really likes FODMAPs, particularly inulin. So if you are on a low FODMAP diet, one of the things that might be seen is a reduction in acromancia. Now I will say this, of the studies that I have seen where they've done microbiota testing or stool testing pre and post low FODMAP, I have yet to see this one documented as one of the ones that goes down. 
But it wouldn't surprise me because one of the ways that I try to feed this in my clinical practice is through the use of things like FOSS and GOSS uh, supplements, so things like inulin and bimuto, and it does seem to work. So I think that this is a FODMAP eater, at least to some extent, and it would stand to reason that the low FODMAP diet could be detrimental to this bacteria. So those are some of the, the biggies. There's a lot of other stuff that can feed acromantia. The polyphenols in tea, like black tea, green tea, white tea, oolong tea, those seem to feed acromantia to some extent. And then also, I mentioned this is one of my first videos in the series, but fasting. Fasting will actually help promote the growth of the mucus-associated microbes and decrease the level of the luminal-associated microbes and the, the bacteria that are more dependent on your food and cannot utilize the mucus as fuel. That The fasting practice will decrease the relative abundance of these guys for a couple of days and increase the growth of things like acromantia. So fasting can also be a way to try to nurture this. So lots of different options. There's, there's actually a lot of other supplements that I haven't mentioned, but those are some of my favorites. Red polyphenols, FODMAP content in the diet or FODMAP supplements like inulin and bimuno, and T polyphenols. Those are some of my favorites to nurture and nourish acromantia. Now, other bacteria that live in and around the mucus layer, it, it, it's a little tricky. As of writing this video or as of recording this, it's a little mixed. I have seen videos that say that Firmicutes bacteria, so things like Fecalobacterium, um, you know, even, even a lot of the short-chain fatty acid producers like Blautia, some studies say that Firmicutes bacteria are more abundant in the mucus. Some say that they are less abundant in the mucus. So I don't truly know. I don't think we know as a species. But more consistently, I have found associations where they say that Bacteroidetes and proteobacteria are relatively enriched in the mucus lining and Firmicutes generally are gonna stick more in the lumen. Now again, like I'm, I've seen research go both ways on that, but as, as more of a rule of thumb, I would say that Bacteroidetes and proteobacteria are in there. So for example, proteobacteria could include things like E. coli, And it does seem that E. coli see, likes to replicate in the mucus as opposed to out in the lumen. So that's one example of a proteobacteria species. And then you're gonna laugh at this, hold on. One of the Bacteroidetes species that seems to live in the mucus, I literally, I had to write it down because it's a very long word and I'm not skilled at pronouncing this. So it's Bacteroides theta io tau micron. Lord knows. If somebody knows how to pronounce that properly, please record it, email it to me because Lord only knows. But as far as I can tell, sounding it out, theta, tia, theta eo tau micron. Let's just call it B theta for short. So B theta seems to live in and amongst the mucus as well. And it seems to be involved in some crossfeeding. meaning that this bacteria makes a compound when it eats the mucus or when it eats something. That bacteria makes a compound that then goes on to feed other bacteria like the Calibacterium prudsnitzii. So it's a really neat microbe and it's in that Bacteroidetes phylum. These, all three of these are gram negative bacteria. So if any of you are microbiology buffs or nerds, all three of these are going to be gram negative bacteria so it seems like that's what the mu mucus layer is favoring a little bit more versus Firmicutes, which are going to be gram positive. So that's kind of what I've seen more as a pattern in research. The other thing, let's see, the, uh, the exception, I had to look at what species it was, but Bifidobacteria bifidum also does seem to like hanging out because I'm running out of room here, but I guess I'll just put it like, you know, here. I'll just write B. bifidum. Seems to like the mucus. Now, I don't know if that's across the board for all of Bacteroidetes, if, or I'm not, not Bacteroidetes, uh, Bifidobacterium, but it seems like in other studies I've seen where they compare the stool testing or luminal contents to the mucus, it seems like the phylum that this belongs to, the big category, of actinobacteria seems to be more abundant in the lumen. 
and a little bit less abundant in the mucus. So I think that this might be more intrinsic to B. bifidum as opposed to other types of bifido like, you know, infantis or long gum or some of the other species. Uh, but again, I think that this is still a relatively new topic in research, so go figure. The last thing that seems to be enriched in the loose mucus more consistently is ruminococcus. And this, uh, most frequently I will bring this up, more in the context of when I have somebody do a gut biome plus test from Somagen, which I've spoken about on this channel before, they will break down the results and they'll give you a list that says, are you more of a protein degrader, carbohydrate degrader, or a mixed presentation type? At ruminococcus, usually if you have more ruminococcus in your stool sample, they will say that you're more of a mixed type. As opposed to somebody who has, for example, a lot of bacteroidetes, they would deem that person more of a protein degrader or protein digester based on their microbiome. So ruminococcus also seems to like the mucus, but the big ones that I would say that I see most commonly in the research are Acromantia mucinophilia and B theta, and then to some extent, these other ones, I would say also the proteobacteria E. coli thing is fairly consistent at this point. The bifidobacteria seem hit and miss, but B. bifidum does like the mucus. Ruminococcus generally seems to like mucus. And then the firmicutes as a whole group and the actinobacteria as a whole group seem like it's kind of mixed, but maybe they stick more in the lumen. So if you're gonna to try to target these guys and try to feed them, most of your effort could be spent on trying to feed acromantia, feed bifidobacterium with things like the polyphenols, maybe probiotics for each of those, depending, and um, you know, T polyphenols and FODMAPs and that sort of thing. I wouldn't try to feed E. coli, but there is a probiotic for E. coli, and it's a good species of E. coli that competes with the bad guys. So that is a consideration as well. You can get this. Uh, Acromantia is now available as a probiotic in the United States. Again, I don't have experience with it, but it is available. B. bifidum certainly is available in probiotics in the United States. And there is one E. coli probiotic, Mutaflor. It's E. coli Nissel 1917. And it was actually the very first probiotic ever developed back in 1917. So those are your microbes that live in your mucus. As we research the microbiome more, I'm sure that this is going to evolve. Frankly, we don't know a ton about the mucus layer microbiome right now, but this seems to be the most consistent from what I can tell. And if you want to try to keep your mucus layer healthy and therefore prevent leaky gut and the things that are associated with leaky gut, I think that giving some TLC to your acromantia and your bifidobacterium would go a long, long way. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.